Hi, I'm John Berman, and I'd like to talk about the relationship between algebraic K-theory and the Riemann hypothesis. So this relationship has a long history. In the 1940s, Vey sketched a proof of the Riemann hypothesis over finite field, assuming the existence of some well-behaved Vey cohomology. This program was famously carried out by Grothendieck and Deligne, who constructed a Vey cohomology theory and showed that it satisfied the right properties. More recently, Denninger sketched a proof of the Riemann hypothesis itself, assuming the existence of a certain cohomology theory and R. Kellogg geometry. So far, there just aren't any well-understood cohomology theories in R. Kellogg geometry. But my work on enriched category theory will allow us to construct some for the first time. So what I'd like to do is explain first, what is R. Kellogg geometry? Second, I'll introduce algebraic K-theory, which is an example of a cohomology theory. And third, I'll talk about my research, which constructs algebraic K-theory and R. Kellogg geometry. So what is R. Kellogg geometry? Well, in algebraic geometry, we study the scheme spec Z instead of the ring Z. It has one point for each prime ideal in Z. But in algebraic number theory and arithmetic geometry, we often want access to an additional prime at infinity. The reason is because we think of primes as valuations on the field of rationals, not as prime ideals. There's a p-adic valuation for each prime p, but there's also the ordinary absolute value, which corresponds to the so-called prime at infinity. This spec z bar is a kind of one-point compactification of spec z called the r Kellogg compactification. Denninger's program asks about cohomology theories over it. Now, you should keep in mind that this spec z bar is not a real scheme, just a hypothetical object, but it plays an important philosophical role in arithmetic geometry. For example, it provides a conceptual explanation of Tate duality in global class field theory. Now let's talk about algebraic K-theory. K-theory is a cohomological invariant of a ring or a scheme. In other words, the K-theory of a ring is a system of abelian groups which assemble into a cohomology theory, that is, a spectrum in the sense of algebraic topology. Actually computing the K-theory of a ring, however, is notoriously difficult, even for the most basic ring, Z. But it carries rich information about number theory. For example, it's believed that the K-theory of the integers is zero in degrees divisible by four. But this is equivalent to the Venn Diver conjecture, an open problem in algebraic number theory dating to 1850 which concerns the class number of cyclotomic fields. On the other hand, the odd degree K theory of Z is known, but remarkably, it contains information about the values of the Riemann zeta function. Uh, the relationship involves calculating the volume of K two and minus one as a lattice inside the vector space K two and minus one tensor the reals. I'd like to compute the K theory of the R. Kellogg compactification of Z. The problem, is that the R. Kellogg compactification is not a well-defined ring or even a scheme. However, there is a good notion of a module over this z-bar. A module is something like a real vector space equipped with a lattice and a norm. There are a few independent reasons from arithmetic geometry that this may be the right definition. So I already said that algebraic k-theory is an invariant of a ring R. In fact, it can be constructed even if we don't know R, as long as we know the category of R modules and all of the X groups. By the way, this is exactly why K-theory is well suited to R. Kellogg geometry. Now, the groups X to MN form a cohomology theory or a spectrum, so the category mod R is enriched in spectra. That just means that between any two objects, there's a whole spectrum worth of homomorphisms, not just a set. So K-theory is now an invariant of spectrum-enriched categories. This relates to the K-theory of rings in this sense. The K-theory of R is the same as the K-theory of the category mod R, just by definition. I have to mention a technical point here. Spectra don't really form a nice category, but instead an infinity category. It's just a way of remembering homotopy theoretic information about cohomology theories or spectra. In a sense, it's just a technical point, but it's important because it makes everything that I'll say about category theory more difficult to prove and to make precise. Another reason why we might want to study K-theory at this level of generality is that K-theory has a very nice universal property as an invariant of spectrum-enriched infinity categories. Without the infinity categorical language, no universal property like this is known. So, so we set out to understand the K-theory of the R. Kellogg compactification Z-bar. And that question just didn't make any sense. Now we can ask a new question. Okay, what is the K-theory of the category mod Z-bar? 
this does make sense almost, but there's still a problem, which is that mod Z bar is not enriched in spectra. It's enriched in something slightly different, something which C is not only a cohomology theory X, but also lattices and norms. In other words, we're missing information about the X groups. So in order to understand K theory and R Kellogg geometry, we first have to understand categories enriched in infinity categories other than spectra. That's something I've worked on over the past year. Second, we should study the K theory of enriched infinity categories. And that's work in progress. And third, I'd like to introduce our Kellogg geometry into the story. The K theory of Z bar should presumably know the K theory of Z, but also some lattices and norms. By the way, that's exactly what was needed to compute these lattice volumes that come up in Burrell's work. So this is copied from an earlier slide. So we're already seeing the relationship to the Riemann zeta function. But let me now address this first point and tell you about some of my work on enriched infinity categories. Imagine that script R is the category of abelian groups. Then a category is R enriched if its HOM sets have an abelian group structure. It's an old concept and it's been generalized anytime R is a category with a tensor product. Gebner and Haugsang have ported this definition into the language of infinity categories not too long ago. That was not easy, okay, but the only thing you need to know about it is that this definition is completely combinatorial, which means it's comparatively easy to produce examples, but hard to prove theorems about. On the other hand, there's a notion of an R module category, and that's a completely algebraic notion. So it's comparatively easy to prove theorems about using techniques from higher algebra which were pioneered by Jacob Lurie. Okay, these two definitions don't seem to be related a priori, but I've proven that the category of R enriched categories is a subcategory of R modules. And the second point here describes exactly which subcategory. This is the main theorem of a series of three papers, the first of which is uh, at this link, and the next two are being written now. All you need to know about this theorem though is that it completely reduces enriched category theory to higher algebra, and that's better understood and easier to use. For example, if S is the infinity category of spectra, we can think of spectrum enriched infinity categories as S modules in a very literal sense. So we had already generalized K theory from algebra to category theory, which may be a little unsettling, but now we can bring it full circle back to algebra involving S modules. So now we have a combinatorial model for enriched infinity categories. We have an algebraic model, and now we know they're equivalent. In the combinatorial model, the data of an enriched category is parameterized by some combinatorial gadget OS. By a very formal procedure, any local coefficient system on OS will give us a cohomological invariant of enriched categories. Instead of explaining this in more detail, I just want to give you two examples. First of all, if we start with the locally constant system with coefficients in a circle, then we get topological Hochschild homology, or THH. This is the main result of my paper down here. We can also define the nerve of an enriched category in a very similar way. From this perspective, we can construct the K theory of an enriched category as a nerve. On the other hand, if we work from the algebraic model for enriched infinity categories, we can define K theory in terms of a universal property. Each of these definitions generalizes a uh, classical construction of algebraic K theory. Uh, the first one is more amenable to explicit computation and the second is better for proving theorems. So in particular, if we wanna do serious work with enriched K theory, it's natural to ask, are these two definitions equivalent? I also wanna reiterate here that the R. Kellogg compactification of Z has a well-defined category of modules. So now for the first time, it's algebraic K theory is something that we can really get our hands on. Okay, all of this is ongoing work. Now, the million dollar problem here is to find a vague homology theory in our Kellogg geometry. That would solve the Riemann hypothesis. So it's still a distant goal, but at least we've defined some homology theories now. That is, we've defined K theory and THH. Now, these aren't vague homology theories, admittedly, but Hesselholt has shown that periodic cyclic homology, or TP, should have some of the properties of a vague homology theory. This TP 
is closely related to this THH. So this is encouraging. Now let me just finish by saying that these techniques should be applicable anywhere we study a generalized ring with a well-defined category of modules. For example, it should give us cohomological invariance in tropical geometry or over the so-called field with one element. These are subjects I, I want to learn more about. Thanks for listening.